Now, I understand everyone's been sitting here for about an hour and a half, almost two hours. Can I suggest uh, we all stand up and just have a quick stretch? Just wave your arms around. Now, um, Rebecca Davison, would you put your hand up, please? Um, it was, it's Rebecca's birthday today. Perhaps you'd like to um, stretch your vocal cords and join me in singing Happy Birthday. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday, dear Rebecca. Happy Birthday to you. Hip hip. Hip hip. Hip hip. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Fantastic movie. Um, Neve, our hero, befriends Abby, a prodigious eight-year-old artist, and her mother, Angela. Now, Neve becomes romantically involved with Megan, who he believes is Abby's older sister. But as we learn, Abby is not who we think she is. Megan is not. No, this is actually a, a, a documentary. Yes, there's been some, some question, I guess, about whether the movie is, is real um, or, or, or true, I guess, and um, uh, by all accounts, it, it is. And Angela, of course, is not who we think she is. As we find out, Angela's married with two disabled sons. She painted Abby's paintings and had the relationship with Neve as Megan. And she achieved this using two mobile phones, one house phone, and over a dozen Facebook profiles. And clearly a lot of time on her hands. Questions. How many people in this room use Facebook? How many people don't? Okay, so about half-half. And how many people here use the internet? And how many people don't? Interesting. Now, according to Facebook, middle of September when I took these stats, 11.5 million Australians, approximately 50% of the population, have a Facebook account. And according to Internet World Stats, about 84% use the Internet on a regular basis, either um, a hard line or via mobile. Now, Facebook is a fascinating beast. It's, it's certainly changed the way we communicate and the way we think about relationships. You probably read in the media a couple of days ago that uh, Facebook now has one billion monthly active users. And more than half a billion people around the world, that's one in 14 people, use the, the Facebook site every day. Now, as we all know, Facebook uh, listed on the stock exchange recently. The shares peaked at $45. And as last night, they were just under $21. Now, when Facebook uh, listed, they had to declare um, the, the profile of users, and they had to admit that 9% of almost 1 in 10 Facebook accounts are fake. That's almost 90 million fake accounts, which suggests that Neve's experience probably isn't unique. The warning. The Internet is a wonderful communication tool. And catfish is a tale of deceit that unravels. So when does exaggeration become deceit, then become a lie? Rebecca, it's not actually her birthday today, it was her birthday two weeks ago. Uh, was I lying was I exaggerating? Now we know that deceit isn't confined to the internet. Uh, we all know of door-to-door -door salesman scams, postal scams, telephone scams. The, the scam isn't necessarily in the, the technology, it's in, it's in individuals. And Catfish, of course, reminds us that it's wise to wonder who is on the other computer. The Internet. Ubiquitous. By virtue of its benefits and advantages, the Internet is used by and has transformed all services. Education. Many people now engage in education online. Um, transport. Um, the way the Internet has meant that we can book flights anywhere around the world at any time has, has transformed and revolutionised air travel. Um, justice, um, business, and of course health services. And now my research team and I are primarily interested in how we can use the internet to treat people with anxiety and depression. So let's segue, and I hope you like the segue, into talking a wee bit about anxiety and depression. Now, according to the National Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing, which was a large epidemiological survey published in 2007, 
approximately 6% of the adult population in Australia met diagnostic criteria for a mood disorder, including depression, in the previous 12 months. That, that amounts to more than 1 million Australian adults. Anxiety disorders affected 1 in 7 percent of people. I'm sorry, 1 in 7 people, approximately 14 percent of the population in the previous 12 months. That's more than 3 million people. So really the take-home message is we know that conditions such as anxiety and depression are common. We also know from these epidemiological surveys that only minority, only approximately 35% of people with anxiety and depression at these clinical levels reported that they sought treatment in the previous 12 months, and only 15% reported that they saw a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Clearly there are a significant number of people who are affected and very few receive evidence-based treatment. Now that begs the question, do we have treatments that work? Well, the good news is, yes, we do. We know that medications are effective, we know that psychological treatments are effective, and we know more so that the combination of pharmacotherapies and psychological therapies are more effective than either one alone in treating moderate to severe cases of anxiety or depression. But we also know that there are significant barriers to treatment. Many people struggle for, the, for reasons associated with the direct costs as well as indirect costs. People have to take time off work or other responsibilities. They have to pay to travel to treatment. And of course we know that many people don't recognise that sometimes symptoms reach a point of severity where they would benefit from help and that help is possible. And we call that mental health literacy. For many people in Australia, they're affected by the, the tyranny of geography. There are no mental health professionals, let alone other health professionals. And of course the, the symptoms of anxiety and depression conspire against treatment seeking. Anxiety and depression, as we all know, are characterised by avoidance and fear and low mood, low energy, low motivation. And these, the, these are all things people need to overcome in order to be able to seek treatment. Now th these issues, these barriers have led a number of research teams around Australia and around the world, including our own, to ask the question, can we treat people with anxiety and depression via the internet? Now, um, my colleague uh, Dr Blake Dare and I, over the last uh, uh, year or so since we've been here at Macquarie, have uh, been examining this question and we've, we've constructed the eCentre Clinic at the Centre for Emotional Health and Department of Psychology here at Macquarie. And we've developed a research program along with our colleagues that develops and evaluates internet-delivered treatments for anxiety, depression and chronic pain. Now, we, we, when we talk with people about our treatments, many people are confused by the paradigm, confused by the heuristic and, and what we do, but all the techniques, all the procedures are, are, are pragmatic. They're practical psychological skills that we all need to practice on a daily basis to stay emotionally healthy. And the process is very simple for people. They apply online. One of our therapists then, then telephoned them to administer a telephone diagnostic interview to ensure that the course the person has applied for is likely to, to meet their needs and be of benefit. And then people begin a structured online course. They log in weekly, they read online lessons, they practice homework assignments, and they receive weekly support via telephone or email from one of our therapists. This is what people see when they log in, when they register for our courses. I apologise that, that, that I can't um, I'll show you much more detail, but in the top left-hand corner you'll see there are a number of um, folders, uh, lesson one to, to five materials. People log in and click on one of those folders and work their way every week through uh, a series of online lessons. Now the lessons are essentially in slide-based format, and I'll show you some examples now. Here is the first lesson of slide one, uh, the first time um, slide of lesson one. You can see people can learn about anxiety, low mood and depression. The material is presented in, in an engaging and user-friendly way. We've actually minimised the jargon uh, quite effectively. The, the reading age um, uh, is approximately suitable for a 10-year-old. We explain how common these conditions are. We normalise them because we know that, that many people uh, have difficulty accessing or seeking treatment because of concerns around stigma. And yet these conditions are are actually all norm, part of the normal human condition, but just extreme examples. People learn about their symptoms, learn about how to manage their symptoms using very pragmatic, practical, effective tools. And of course we have many examples from, from people we've worked with uh, about how to apply the skills in the context of someone's everyday life so that they can learn to practice these things in the natural rhythm, I guess, of their day-to-day their -day existence. So, 
two questions to finish off with. Firstly, does internet therapy work? We published a, a meta-analysis, a systematic review um, in 2010, um, which was a summary of the 22 most recent studies of online treatment for different anxiety disorders and depression. And in this meta-analysis, we, we found that internet treatment was consistently superior to control conditions, to comparison conditions. And importantly, the results or the, the protocols were highly acceptable to consumers. And a number of the studies we reviewed directly compared internet treatments with face-to-face -face treatments, and there was no difference um, uh, in their effectiveness. And if there was a difference, it was slightly in favour of the internet treatments, was, which was a significant surprise to all of us. In our own research, we, we started by treating people with social phobia online, and we obtained very encouraging results. So encouraging, then, that we began conducting similar trials of online treatment for other conditions, such as depression, panic disorder, generalised anxiety disorder, and even more complex conditions such as obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. More recently we've developed with support from organisations like Beyond Blue and the uh, National Health and Medical Research Council, uh, programs for older adults, uh, culturally and linguistically diverse communities. And um, we're also testing some of our programs here at Macquarie University through student counselling. And we've been busy, we've completed or are finishing 40 trials with more than 3,200 Australian adults. And again, I'll stress, we, we haven't met any of them. Now in terms of our results, we've been, we've been surprised. Our online treatments have been effective. Uh, there have been significant reductions on symptoms of clinical measures. 50% of people, at least, who start treatment um, and meet diagnostic criteria uh, before treatment begins no longer meet diagnostic criteria at post-treatment, and those results are sustained at follow-up. We've also noted, and this has been a significant surprise as well, that the online treatments require considerably less therapist time, which I guess should, should be a no-brainer, really, because we're presenting much of the education and information online for people to read about themselves in their own time. We found that one hour of internet therapist time produces very similar outcomes as five hours of face-to-face -face therapist time. And 95% of the people who complete our programs tell us that they refer a friend, and 95% report it was worth their time doing the course. They're encouraging outcomes. Okay, what do patients and therapists say? Well, we've asked the last um, 350 people who've completed our programs in the last two months, would they support these courses becoming freely available? And 352 out of 354 have said yes, and these are the kinds of remarks people have made. Not everyone is ready to approach a professional about their problems, so these courses are a great place to start some form of therapy. If people learn the skills to manage stress and depression early, then maybe they won't become a serious problem. And these, these comments demonstrate significant insight. People are aware that these, the information that we teach in our courses is pragmatic and practical and, and should be taught uh, to everybody at schools. Um, we all need to work on our mental health and there are things we can all do on a daily basis to stay emotionally well. Two out of the 354 people said no, they wouldn't support these types of interventions becoming freely available. I followed up with one person who, who made the comment, I doubt whether I'd do this course in the public domain as I live in a regional rural area and wouldn't feel comfortable. The background story is the person lives in a, a, a regional area of Australia. Uh, they have no internet connection apart from the local library and they, they, they felt uncomfortable having to log in there, understandably so. Um, and the, the other person didn't provide a reason. What about therapists? What do therapists say? We've trained and, and worked with more than 30 uh, therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, clinical psychologists. And um, without exception, including Blake and myself, we've, we've been sceptical. How, how, the the, the uh, concept of online treatment appears to be almost in, in, in complete contradiction to everything we've been trained to do in, as, as a face-to-face -face therapist. And we're all sceptical. But subsequently, everyone would say, well, I'd certainly use it in my own practice once we've treated our first 100 patients and, and seen benefits. And, and we've been surprised, much like in, in Catfish, that people can become so highly involved and so engaged, even without face-to-face -face contact. And we've been surprised consistently how effective and how acceptable these interventions are. So I'm an acolyte. I, um, I've seen many people go through our courses over a number of years. Uh, 
I've seen the, the results of different therapists and, and treating different disorders and different age groups and results are consistently very encouraging. And so I certainly believe that internet interventions have an important part to play in contributing to our mental health services. But of course I'm also a realist. Um, as the cartoon indicates, technology isn't going to save everybody and, and we need to, to be realistic about that as well. So, in summary, we know that 20% of the adult population suffer depression or anxiety disorders each year, and we know that many people experience barriers to treatment. Now, we believe that internet delivered treatments have potential for improving access to evidence based treatments. So, I'd like to finish my part of the talk and, and, and certainly then open it up for, for questions if people are interested, um, and finish with uh, the, almost a soliloquy by Vince Pierce at the very end of the movie. And Vince finishes off by saying, they used to tank cod from Alaska all the way to China. They'd keep them in vats in the ship. By the time the cod reached China, the flesh was mush and tasteless. So this guy came up with the idea that if you put these cods in these big vats, put some catfish in with them, the catfish will keep the cod agile. And there are those people who are catfish in life, and they keep you on your toes. They keep you guessing, they keep you thinking, they keep you fresh. I'd like to, um, uh, I guess, close by uh, acknowledging the superb research team I'm privileged to work with, um, led by Professor Ron Rapay, who, I should say, uh, uh, recommended the Catfish movie to us this evening, and um, thank the organisations who have been involved in supporting our work over the years, including Australian Rotary Health, Beyond Blue, and the NHMRC. So thank you very much for your time this evening. I'm not sure if people would like to ask questions, but we would certainly like to invite people to ask questions, and I believe we have a, a roving mic. Is there anything I have to do here to switch that on? Oh, absolutely, without a doubt. And and um, uh, it's interesting. I've, I've tried to get a sense of what Angela's background story is and what happened to her after the movie. And um, there is some controversy about about um, the movie in terms of whether or not they should even have have uh, filmed and produced the movie um, uh, in the end. Um, but certainly, I agree with you. Other comments, questions? I think we'll, we'll try with the mic again if possible. There we go. Good therapist start. Hello, I'm John. It's not my birthday. I could be lying. Mm. Um, I'm intrigued with the concept of a, a, a treatment which is essentially fixed. So when you go into a lesson, the lesson plan is fixed or has a limited number of divergences to cope with a, a specific situation. One of the things I associate with talking to somebody professionally is that they will change their responses in reaction to whatever stimulus it is that I'm providing. So, so how does the internet treatment take that need into account? Why is it so successful, clearly? Mm. Look, that's a fantastic question, and, and um, I think it speaks to the, the nature of psychotherapy, and, and, and as has been uh, commented on by, by uh, numerous um, highly regarded psychologists and psychiatrists, particularly in the last five years, we still don't really understand the nature of, of psychotherapy in terms of psychotherapeutic change. Um, there are significant questions outstanding. Now, our, our sense really speaks to, to the way we conceptualise psychotherapeutic change, which is, um, at the very least, what we're supporting people to do is to learn to recognise habits of thought and action which are unhelpful. For example, we know that anxiety and depression or anxiety disorders and depression, which represent quite a broad range of, of different so-called conditions, share enormous similarities. They're associated with certain thoughts, uh, certain physical symptoms, certain behaviours, including avoidance. 
our approach has been that we've, we've felt that it's been very difficult to individualise a treatment approach for every single person. Although we'd like to, we, we don't believe that, given that there are more than 4 million people in Australia alone who meet diagnostic criteria, that we have the capacity or resources. We've taken the approach whereby we've deconstructed the nature of psychopathology in terms of the core symptoms, and we've identified the most effective psychological treatments which appear to be effective at tackling those symptoms. And we systematically teach people how to tackle those groups of symptoms using those particular skills. And we found that over, over the, uh, quite a large number of trials, as, as you heard, 40 trials in fact, that by providing people with core information, key skills, people can start to learn to apply those skills to their own individual context, and thus they individualise how they're going to manage their life stresses and situations and responses. But we're providing the core skills, the core education. So essentially you're providing the framework of their internalising an approach to using the framework. Yes, another way of thinking about it is that we, we're not becoming experts on each individual patient's mental health. We are teaching them core skills and we're supporting them to become experts in their own mental health. And what we've essentially found is that the less we do as therapists, the better the outcomes in the long term for patients, which is again a surprise. And, and this whole endeavour for us is, has been a, a series of, of fascinating surprises which have challenged our expectations and beliefs about therapy. Thank you for your question. Uh, given, the, given that you don't meet the patients and for the possibility of deception online, I was wondering how you measure therapeutic change and if there are any ways to confirm um, the changes of that. Yes, the, the question is about um, identity and, and again speaks to issues around catfish in terms of how do we know the people we're working with are, are, are who they say they are and how do we know that the change that we, we seem to be observing is real change. From a uh, clinical trials perspective, we seek a lot of additional information from people in addition to their name. We, we, we um, uh, request uh, details of GP uh, practice, um, the person's telephone numbers, um, uh, pers the person's address, and that in itself provides it. Uh, and obviously we, we confirm that via a, a diagnostic telephone interview. So we have a reasonable sense that the people we're communicating with are who they say they are. In terms of measuring therapeutic change, we, we administer quite a broad range of different measures and, and using different methodologies. People complete the standard clinical diagnostic measures, um, which are administered by a therapist. So via telephone, at, uh, before treatment, and then at the end of treatment, and then three month follow-up, we use the same diagnostic tools online as we do face-to-face. -face. We administer them via telephone. Now in addition to that, we also administer classic outcome measures. These are measures of, for example, the severity of symptoms of anxiety and depression. And we use the same tools online as we use face-to-face, -face, and we know that, that they're still as valid and reliable, if not actually more so, online. Because when we administer measures online, we ask people how they really feel online without a therapist present. We, we have found, and other research teams around the world have found, that the answer is more likely to be valid. We also ask people about change in their lives. What are they doing post-treatment or during treatment which they weren't able to do before treatment? So there are three sources of, of evidence that we look at and those, those data almost invariably converge. Just asking a question in a different way. It's great the research that you're using and where it's going. Now, if I ask the opposite question about the internet, why does it seem to be amplifying the need? I think 10% have false accounts. Why is it uh, really um, panning or encouraging people of um, either false identities or imaginary alias identities and, and their self-expression? I was interested in your view as to um, I mean, technology can be used in a good and a bad way, but why is it uh, for some people um, encouraging to them to uh, behave in that other way? It's a fascinating question. The question is why essentially is almost one in ten Facebook accounts um, false? Uh, now I'm, I can't answer that, um, and I wonder whether we're, we're just really becoming aware of perhaps the extent of deceit uh, using technology because we're, we're now at a stage in our civilizational development where we're actually able to measure and track 
um, what, what people are actually saying and, and determine the validity of it. Now, a qualifier around that is that apparently, and I'm not sure the exact statistics, but a significant proportion of those false Facebook accounts are actually created by Facebook. Now, I'm not sure the reasons why. I suspect there might be some uh, commercial reasons. Uh, there might be some technical reasons with respect to having to check accounts, but why um, uh, they would need more than um, several thousand fa false accounts, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, Look, it's a great question. I can only speculate, um, and and um, I, I wonder whether it's that slippery slope of, of deceit, exaggeration, um, and, and I suspect there are there are many reasons why why, why that would occur. In Facebook. I'm, I'm not sure, perhaps someone else could answer the question. The, the question is, is there a way to destroy a profile, one's profile on Facebook? My understanding is that you can deactivate it, but they actually keep your profile. Is that correct? Do people um, I, I believe you can actually, if you, if you fully delete it, you can then, after 30 days, it does completely erase. Okay. Um, it's something they've had to implement recently. Just the, yeah. Also, um, just sorry. One, I don't know if it's if it's, if it's included in the fake accounts, but my little brother makes quite a lot of accounts for our pets. So. <laughs> Hi, um, fabulous to hear all your great um, yeah, research data. But do you have any? Have you collected data about dropout rates? One of the big things that happens in real therapy is that people might start keenly and then drop out for a whole bunch of reasons. And so I just wonder whether that might particularly apply to more complex. Mm. The great question, and the question is around attrition in, in, in therapy online, and as we know in face-to-face -face therapy, a significant proportion of people, depending on the complexity of the condition, uh, do find that treatment is, is so challenging, uh, for, 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 or for other reasons, they withdraw from treatment during treatment. We've found typically 80% of people who start our, our courses finish our courses. Um, the follow-up data in terms of the, the scores and the outcome measures of post-treatment and follow-up, approximately 90 to 95% on, on, on in some of our trials, maybe a bit lower in, in others, but we're getting quite, quite full data sets and quite high levels of completion. We do follow up with people who don't complete our courses um, and who decide to withdraw. We, we encourage people, if they aren't making progress or if they aren't um, are continuing with the course, to consider other treatment options. Uh, because we, we believe we have an ethical responsibility to ensure people get the support they, they require and need, and if, if they don't receive it from us, we're very happy to make referrals as, as, if we can. Avril. What do you do if you somebody suicidal? It's, a, it's a, um, uh, a fundamental part of our interventions is to monitor people's well-being through the intervention. So every week when they log in, we ask them to complete measures around their mood and anxiety levels. And really the aim of that is to be able to identify proactively when people are deteriorating so that we can actually um, catch people before they get to the point where they're starting to feel so hopeless they're thinking about, about suicide. When people do experience that, that level of severity, uh, we, we provide, we have a number of protocols in place which we um, activate um, with a series of telephone calls and follow-ups telephone triages, risk assessments, and risk management strategies to support people to stay safe. And we've been very successful with those. Can I suggest one final comment or question, and then I'll bid you all a, a, a very good night. Frontier. Model of therapy is a, it, it's a combination of cognitive behavioural and interpersonal therapy. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. The, the strategies are very pragmatic and, and proactive about supporting people to learn skills and techniques which they can use in their everyday life, rather than necessarily focusing on on, on past. 
um, events or, or the factors that might, might have precipitated. Important as they might be, we really do, do support people to learn the skills which will help them to reduce disability on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, people can log into our website um, and I can show you the, the URL, um, perhaps afterwards if you're happy to come up, and people can, can learn about our, our available courses online. Look, I'd like to suggest then that um, uh, we wind up for the evening. Again, I'd like to thank you all for, for your attendance. Can I just finish by um, uh, thanking the um, uh, events crew from Macquarie, um, Liam